Thank you so much, uh, Beo. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our first FNF Learning Series session. Um, we are very, very happy to have you all here. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear that we actually ex uh, are exceeding capacity. And I hope uh, and I say hello to everybody who is watching through our other channels, for example, on Facebook. Um, we decided to do a learning series uh, because we felt um, that you know one of our jobs as a, um, a foundation is to actually bring policies uh, closer to the public. Uh, we would like to you know initiate um, a discussion uh, on uh, on policies. We would like to have transparency. Uh, we're all about participation. So um, we are very happy to have this series. It's uh, the first of many series uh, sessions that we are going to have, and we are very much looking forward to it. Um, as a foundation, economic freedom is at the core of our work, and we believe it's important for any developing society because with the economy strengthening, um, the rising tide lifts all boats. And uh, especially now during the COVID crisis, we believe that we have to look at how can we make economy resist, uh, resilient? How can we make sure that the economy will bounce back uh, after or during even now during the COVID crisis. Um, we are therefore very, very happy to have Congresswoman Stella Kimbo, a champion of economic freedom here. Uh, we've been working with her for a long time already and we are very, very proud of knowing her ever since uh, I actually got to know her as a commissioner of the Philippine Competition Commission. Thank you so much for being here, um, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. We are going to talk today about the House Bill number 6815, uh, which is also known as the Accelerated Recovery and Investment Stimulus for the Economy of the Philippines, um, the Arise Philippines Act. Um, the 1.3 trillion pesos Arise includes, among others, a budget of 650 billion pesos for an expanded infrastructure program on healthcare, education, and food security. There will also be 20 billion pesos allotted for mass testing. Um, now, when we look at uh, different countries, you know, um, when we look at, for example, the numbers of uh, the figures from the Asia Development Bank, um, every country has a different way of, you know, having a stimulus response. Uh, when we look at, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand has the largest uh, stimulus package in Southeast Asia with 84 billion. Um, but for example, the Philippines at the moment uh, has sort of only allotted uh, $19 billion uh, as a stimulus package. So we are very interested to hear also from uh, Congresswoman Stella Kimbo, um, you know, what that package means, uh, how that is going to work out. Um, the, the budget is actually possible um, because we know that uh, due, through the Bahan, sorry, Bayan Nihan, to heal as I'm one act, uh, the president actually has the special powers to address the, the pandemic and to um, uh, sort of um, switch uh, the funding. Um, so we are very much looking forward to this. Um, I know there's also a discussion. Uh, we have, for example, Department of Finance Secretary Sonny Domingo saying that there are not enough funds for the implementation. Um, but I'm sure um, our esteemed uh, Congresswoman will be able to, to answer all these uh, issues and questions. And I'm very, very much looking forward uh, to hearing from you. And I'd like to thank you for being here and uh, giving us this overview. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's here, who made this possible, who are there as reactors, as discussants. And of course, last but not least, everybody who's, who's listening here, um, I'm really happy because that really means that people are interested in these issues and it's a, it's a very timely topic. So giving back to you, Bea, and thank you so very much and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, now for the highlight of our program, we are all here to learn from teacher Stella herself about House Bill 16. Also known as the Arise Philippine Act, which was approved on its final reading in the Congress in June 4, 2020. So I would just like to tell you something about Kong Stella. So um, Kong Stella 
Timbo is the duly elected representative of the second district of Marikina City and the assistant minority leader of the 18th Philippine Congress. So she is an academician who served as professor and department chair of the University of the Philippines School of Economics. In 2016, she was appointed commissioner of the Philippine Competition Commission, where she served for three years, also as well as mentioned. For, from 2011 to 2013, she was the Prince Claus Professorial Chairholder at Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Dr. Kibo has an extensive research portfolio in the field of health economics, industrial organization, microeconomics, education, poverty, and public policy and regulation. I would, I would like to invite Congresswoman Kibo, principal author of the Arise Philippines Act, for her presentation. All right, thank you, Bea. Can you hear me? All right, thank you, Bea. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. Um, Siyempre, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat, lalong-lalo na sa mga uh, nagpa-participate from outside Metro Manila. Nakita ko mayroon mga taga-Tarlac, taga-Cavite, Pangasinan. Kumusta po kayong lahat? Um, of course, I'm... Uh, Quite happy that uh, you're all interested in uh, today's topic, which is economic recovery. And uh, as we all know, of course, economic recovery is very relevant. It's in everyone's minds today. As we speak, many businesses are closing. Um, our unemployment rate is at an all-time high at 17.7%. As of April uh, 2020, uh, 7.2 million Filipinos are without jobs. And... Uh, so we think that without government action, it is going to be very difficult to reverse this situation. And uh, on the part of Congress, um, our response is in ARISE. So ARISE is Accelerated Recovery for Investment uh, Stimulus for the Economy of the Philippines or ARISE Philippines. It used to be known as PESA or Philippine Economic Stimulus Act. But of course, um, ARISE is a much uh, more... Uh, uh, positive uh, sounding, right? Which is why we adopted the name. But anyway, um, so as Bea mentioned, the Arise Bill was approved on third and final reading last June 4. It has now been transmitted to the Senate. Um, this calls for a 708 billion peso spending for 2020 and about 650 for uh, the next three years. And uh, early on, uh, the first time I filed this bill, which was eight hours before the announcement of the first lockdown, and that was uh, exactly on March 12. What we had in mind really was an economic stimulus package that would uh, promote business continuity. And uh, that would be the way to protect workers from the risk of layoffs. So the Arise Bill is really about protecting workers. And uh, just for context, next slide, please. All right, so ideally, uh, we would have wanted to have an economic stimulus package in place as soon as we lifted lockdown. Now, so in other words, as soon as we reopen by way of the lifting of the lockdown, we should be able to effectively restart if the economic stimulus package were in place. And uh, what are the obstacles in reopening the economy? There are at least two big ones. The first one would be the so-called uh, fear factor of uh, workers, meaning uh, even if you lift the lockdown, many people are still afraid of uh, contracting the disease. So even if the malls are open, uh, consumers are quite wary. And uh, the reason for this is because um, early on, we didn't have uh, access to testing. And so the first one is the so-called fear factor. The other obstacle is uh, would be the liquidity concerns of firms. In other words, um, for three months now, so that's, uh, we started the lockdown, I think, March 13. So it's been uh, almost uh, three months. And uh, during the lockdown, many businesses, meaning the non-essential businesses, were not allowed to operate. But these businesses, which were closed, not earning revenues, no sales, but they had to continue paying um, salaries of their workers. They had to continue paying their loans. They had to, co to continue paying uh, rent expenses and all their other 
overhead expenses. And so by the time lockdown is lifted, you would expect these firms to be cash strapped. And so that would be the, the other important obstacle. And so what would happen if these two concerns will not be addressed? Well, uh, first of all, you would have uh, layoffs of workers. Because um, remember, at this point in time when uh, asset prices would be very low, um, it is actually more difficult to let go of your physical capital, like your factories, your trucks, etc., cetera, um, than to lay off workers, right? So unfortunately, uh, humans at this point in time are, are a bit more, are more uh, dispensable compared to the physical assets. Um, secondly, if we don't address the fear factor among workers in particular and consumers, then we would expect uh, absenteeism in both the workplace as well as the marketplace. And so it is, again, very important to have in place an economic stimulus package that would protect workers from the risk of layoff. And we do that by reviving business confidence, right? removing this fear factor, and of course, making sure that businesses are able to continue. The fourth point I'd like to make is that uh, many of the proposed interventions in ARISE are based on data. And the reason for why we stayed committed to being um, data-driven is that, remember, we are talking about huge amounts of money. So $708 billion is no joke to be spent in the next uh, six months. So we wanted to make sure that those numbers are correct. And uh, more importantly, that uh, the interventions that we will be proposing are uh, well-targeted and impactful. Um, in fact, many of these interventions would have labor conditionalities, meaning you're able to avail of those forms of assistance if you promise to keep your workers. Next, please. So again, just for context, we have about 41 million workers in our economy. And uh, of these 41 million, about 9 million would be more or less unaffected by COVID, meaning to say um, these people are more or less um, assured of uh, being able to keep their jobs. That would include myself, government worker, uh, workers in uh, private households, meaning our kasambahays. And the uh, third would be employees in uh, the essential businesses. So essential businesses are those businesses that were allowed to operate during the lockdown. So in other words, um, at this point in time, they are still very much a going concern. They won't be facing as much liquidity problems. So we would be expecting them to be able to keep their employees. So this would be a total of 9 million workers. But for about 29 million others, these 29 million workers belong to what are called the non-essential businesses. So again, these are the businesses not allowed to operate and therefore at this point in time would most probably be cash trapped. And so workers would be at risk. Next, please. All right, so what would be the most affected sectors? Um, as you all know, with or without the lockdown, it's really tourism as well as our exporters that would be the most affected. Why? Well, because these businesses rely on the movement of people and goods across borders. If you remember early on, I think uh, as early as uh, end January, um, when there was news of COVID-19, many of those tourists that had wanted to come and uh, enjoy the fun in the Philippines had to cancel their trips, right? And uh, in tourism alone, we have about 6.5 million workers. And if we include um, workers in all other sectors that support tourism, we're talking about 30% of the entire labor force. Um, in the trade sector, if uh, we talk about only the exporters as well as those that sell domestically but rely on imported raw materials, we're looking at about 500,000 workers. Next, please. Now, in addition to tourism and trade, these 10 sectors that you're seeing in the slide are those non-essential businesses. So again, they're affected because they're currently now cash strapped more, uh, most likely. And if we rank these sectors according to the size of their payroll, as well as the amount of their loan expenses, um, the top 10 most critically impacted non-essential businesses would be the following. You would have retail trade, land transport, construction, 
You would have crop and animal production, wholesale trade, repair of motor vehicles, manufacture of computer products, which includes semiconductors, which is our top export. Schools are also affected as well as hotels. Um, and then finally, office admin and support services, which would include BPOs. So these 10 non-essential businesses alone would already account for about 23 million workers. So of the 29 million affected workers, which we saw in the previous slide, 23 million of those belong to these 10 sectors. Next, please. And then of course, the other critically impacted sector um, would be the small ones. So by definition, the bigger ones, okay, we know that COVID affected firms of all sizes, whether micro or extra large. But of course, the bigger ones are more likely than not to be able to cope on their own, meaning bigger companies would be able to take out loans on their own versus the small ones. So as a sector, MSMEs are, of course, also by definition critically impacted. And uh, the formerly registered MSMEs, there are about 1 million of them. And of these 1 million, 750,000 belong to the non-essential businesses. And uh, the number that you see in the last column, which is 4.5 million, that would be my estimate of those in the informal sector. Of course, by definition, we don't have official numbers as to how many they are, but this is um, an estimate which I, I computed using national survey data. So overall, we're looking at about 5.25 million small uh, million MSMEs that would be critically impacted by COVID. All right, so what is the general approach in helping all of these critically impacted businesses? Of course, it would be very difficult for a government to come up with a tailor-fitted solution for each and every distressed firm. So um, we think that the best approach would be for businesses themselves to be able to tell government how they want to be helped. And uh, so part of the interventions proposed would be compensation for payroll costs during the lockdown, which again had to be borne by the non-essential businesses. So this is one way to like help these non-essential businesses to move forward, restart their business, um, post lockdown. Of course, capacity building is very important. People keep talking about the new normal. And uh, of course, small businesses will have to cope with this new normal. You're looking at uh, retail stores, brick and mortar stores that all of a sudden need to have um, online sales platforms. Uh, I had a small business in Marikina selling shoes. When I lost my brick and mortar shop in Greenbelt, I had to develop my own website. Uh, I had to figure out the payment system. I had to figure out logistics. Um, what I spent to do that was not a trivial amount. So that's the kind of assistance that we should expect government to be able to provide small businesses. And again, when we say small businesses, this is not limited to only those that are formally registered. We want government to help even the informal ones. Um, third, zero interest loans to boost liquidity. And of course, all other things that are needed to get those loans. Finally, I mentioned this earlier, um, proportionality of assistance is very important. In other words, we have to make sure that the amount of government assistance being provided is right-sized, not too small, not too big. Next, please. Okay, so how big must government uh, spend in order to help the economy recover? This is a very frequently asked question. And the answer to this depends on the extent of the economic damage of COVID. Okay, so what would be the economic damage of COVID? Before COVID happened, our economic managers were expecting us to grow by 6.5%, meaning a GDP growth of 6.5%. Post-COVID, economic managers are saying at this point, that we might be losing 3.5% of growth. In other words, our growth is now going to be negative 3.5%, which means we lose the entire 6.5. In addition, in addition, we lose another 3.5. So that's a total of 10 percentage points uh, in GDP. So 
how much is one percentage point of GDP worth? That's 200 billion pesos. So if we're losing 10 points of that, 200 billion times 10 is 2 trillion pesos. So that would be the estimated economic damage of COVID. Okay, so if that is a loss, the next question would be, how much must government spend in order to reverse that loss? So is it also going to be 2 trillion? Well, the answer is no, because we have this uh, phenomenon called a multiplier effect. Meaning to say, for every one peso that government spends in a particular sector, for example, construction, that one peso will spur activity in other sectors related to construction, for example, cement, for example, hardwares, for example, um, transportation, because you need to transport your cement to your uh, construction site. And if you add up all of these additionally generated business activity, the impact of the one peso is going to be more than one peso, right? Particularly or specifically, it's about 1.53. So for every one peso that government puts in, the impact on GDP is about 1.53 pesos. So because of that multiplier effect, then what government needs to put in is going to be less than 2 trillion because it gets multiplied. So you take 2 trillion, you divide that by 1.53, what you get is 1.3 trillion pesos. So 1.3 trillion pesos is the amount of economic stimulus or the amount of pump priming that government must uh, need to spend on so that it, the economy would be back on track. Okay, next question. How will 1.3 uh, trillion pesos be divided among two important economic institutions? The Banco Central, on the other hand, and national government on the other, all right? So, and more or less, uh, according to, if you look at experiences uh, globally, that's about half and half. So we're looking at about 650 uh, billion pesos to 700 billion pesos that the national government must spend directly in order to, um, to help the economy recover. What will happen to the remainder? That's going to come in the form of credit stimulus. Uh, and that's going to be through monetary policy that would be issued by the Banco Central. In other words, the other half, which is about 650 to 700 billion, that's going to be in the form of additional loanable funds that will be made available through banks. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a rough accounting of why we are proposing 708 billion pesos for the rest of 2020. Okay, so this is like a storified version of Arise. Um, I'm from Marikina, so it's uh, the shoe capital of, of the country. Um, my example is uh, Tony, who has 20 employees and operates a shoe factory. He uh, makes school shoes and during the lockdown, he continued to pay his workers their salaries. He also continued to pay his loans from an informal lender at five, six rates. After the lockdown is lifted, lo and behold, his workers did not show up at work. And he found out that it's because they're all afraid, right? So they were all cooped up in their uh, homes for the past two and a half months um, in the comfort of their homes rather. And now that uh, lockdown has been lifted, okay, they're happy to earn uh, money, but then they're also afraid of getting sick. Um, the answer of Arise to this concern would be subsidies for COVID testing amounting to 20 billion pesos. So we propose 10 billion for 2020 and another 10 billion for 2021, and that's going to be coursed through the LGUs. But again, as a way to assist businesses. Um, Third, Tony checks his fund balances. He realizes he won't be able to sell school shoes. He also realizes that he has to pay for masks, for regular disinfection. He has to put in transparent uh, separators for social distancing in his factory. So clearly he's now incurring more costs. At this point in time, he gets desperate. 
he thinks that he needs to lay off workers. And uh, the Arise Bill says, don't lay off your workers first. Government is here to provide wage subsidies for two months um, with a labor retention clause, meaning you have to promise to keep your workers. And uh, the two months here is really just for Tony to buy time. It's for Tony to figure out what to do in the next 12 to 24 months. I mean, that's, that's a time that uh, we have to uh, wait for the vaccine, right? So what, what happens to him in the next 12 months? Um, we suggest that he takes out interest-free loans and that's going to be made available through the government financial institutions. If he's not used to being or to transacting in a formal bank, because as uh, you see here in this example, his loans are from an informal lender. Um, Arise proposes credit mediation services. So these are like hand-holding services that's going to be provided in every municipality. So things like information, um, uh, uh, business strategies, uh, financial management, that's going to be provided for by the credit mediation desks. And uh, we also suggest the use of e-wallets. So if Tony happens to be a small uh, business in the farthest town of, of the country, he should be able to reach um, this government uh, window through electronic wallets, right? So in other words, we propose the use of digital platforms. And again, this also uh, comes from our experience with Bayani and one where we had great difficulty um, disbursing huge amounts of cash because we were doing that manually. All right, he, Tony also worries about his son's tuition fees. He, uh, during the lockdown, he ended up using all of his savings just to keep his business afloat. And he realizes now that he has to enroll his son, he's out of cash. And uh, the answer of Arise here would be subsidies for education, um, particularly those children of workers in critically impacted sectors. And then uh, Tony thinks about new business uh, opportunities. He's thinking maybe he can manufacture shoes for medical workers and uh, perhaps other protective gear. And uh, again, Arise, under Arise, we will be providing technical assistance of this type through the DTI. Okay, so that's sort of the short run scenario for Tony. What happens in the medium run? There are bigger problems as well. Um, for example, better connectivity would be needed, better roads, which is a constant problem. Um, because of the pandemic, we're also realizing that we need better health facilities. These are also prov provided for under Arise because we call for the crafting of a long-term plan for economic resilience. Next, please. All right, so now what you have here is the full menu of proposed interventions under Arise. And these interventions are classified into five. There's a general intervention, uh, which is mass, massive testing. And this is going to be, again, through LJUs, and, uh, but then ultimately targeted to businesses uh, so that they can screen their workers. Um, we also have transitional uh, measures, which I already mentioned a while back. Wage subsidies would be part of it. Cash for work here is um, a form of unemployment assistance. Uh, it, it's, it's an emergency employment program, actually, that's going to be given for those uh, who will uh, uh, lose their jobs, even with wage subsidies, etc. if because businesses need to, for example, really trim their workforce because of social distancing protocols that they need to follow, then uh, there, you would have a, uh, an unemployment assistance program that would uh, sort of uh, catch all of these displaced workers. Um, in addition to transitional measures, we have financial interventions. Again, this would be zero interest uh, loans, which would include credit mediation services. It would also include loan guarantees because as we all know, um, small businesses might not have um, collateral. And so as a substitute, what they can uh, take out would be uh, credit guarantees also from the government. We also have sectoral relief programs, 
we identify the most critically impacted sectors to include the MSMEs, tourism, we have our globally oriented manufacturing industries and services, meaning our exporters. Um, number four, transportation would also be very critically impacted. And uh, finally, although agri, meaning the food sector is not a non-essential, meaning it's considered an essential business during the lockdown, meaning it did not close. But then we realized that agriculture is key to uh, having uh, a resilient economy, meaning if this pandemic lasts for a long period of time, we must be sure that if we are unable to import food, then at least our domestic producers would be able to feed all of us. Then finally, we have structural interventions. These are the more longer term interventions, which would include enhanced build, build, build. So again, to summarize, 708 billion for 2020, the remainder, uh, which is uh, 700, uh, sorry, 600 billion would be for 2021 and 2022. Okay, so again, um, economic stimulus is really a mix of both monetary and fiscal policy. The thing is, you know, we're, we should be uh, happy that our BSP, our Banco Central, Nam Pilipinas, our central bank, is a very proactive institution. As early as February, they had lowered the reserve requirements. They had uh, issued a lot of uh, policy relief measures. And as a result of that, um, there's increased loanable funds in uh, the banking system. Uh, early April, we estimated that to be about 700 to 800 billion. Recently, in a, in a congressional hearing, the BSP said that this has already increased to 1.1 trillion pesos. But again, um, a big chunk of our population continues to be unbanked. 77.4% of uh, the Filipinos are still unbanked. 82% of our MSMEs are uh, in the informal sector. So uh, we need to be able to, to uh, build the confidence of the unbanked population to try to access those loanable funds. And the way to do that, the way to build confidence is for government to spend an almost equal amount of um, economic stimulus. And I've already mentioned this earlier, wage subsidies, uh, zero interest loans, direct um, grants for technical assistance, et cetera. Next, please. All right, so this is also a frequently asked question, what will happen to our budget deficit um, if we pursue economic stimulus? Last May 13, our economic managers announced that our budget deficit has already reached 8.1%. Budget deficit is just the difference between revenues and expenditures. Um, and of course, uh, this is a big number. Typically, our target without a pandemic is about 3.2%. So clearly, 8.1% is, is a high number because these are extraordinary times. Revenues are... Uh, are much smaller because our economy, our economy had to be shut down, literally. Um, uh, expenditures are also higher because now we have to spend not only for emergency subsidies for households, which is uh, by any and one, um, but also to control the, uh, the, the transmission of the virus itself. So in other words, additional health expenditure. So putting those two together, much limited revenues plus much higher expenditures would equal um, a much higher budget deficit. So the question is, if we spend more on economic stimulus, will that necessarily mean an even much higher budget deficit? And uh, well, the answer is no, if two things happen. One is if we use uh, off-budget financing sources, meaning if we use, for example, um, loans from GOCCs, like for example, if the national government issues bonds and GOCCs would purchase those bonds, that's an example of an off-budget financing source. So if we use um, creative accounting, um, sorry, creative uh, financing sources such as that, then we would be able to avoid um, a ballooning budget deficit. And the second thing, the second condition is, as we spend on economic stimulus, we have to make sure that that amount is spent productively, 
right? And, and if we are able to spend that productively, then our GDP also grows. And when we compute the budget deficit ratio, the denominator is GDP. So if GDP grows, then your budget deficit as a proportion of GDP will not necessarily grow as fast. And so with these two conditions, we think that spending for economic stimulus will in fact make the budget deficit more manageable. Next, please. All right, so these are COVID-19 trends in the ASEAN. I think Wolfgang mentioned a little bit of this a while back. Um, the numbers are not uh, so happy. Um, in terms of active cases per 10,000 population, we have the second highest, uh, we're next to Singapore. In terms of deaths per population, we have the highest. In terms of hospital beds per population, we have the fewest. In terms of tests per population, we don't have the smallest, right? But then uh, we're also, we do, oh, it's also not one of the highest, okay? So uh, we're one of the lower ones, but definitely not the lowest. Um, so that's our COVID situation. In other words, uh, it's, it's somewhat um, difficult. It's a difficult COVID situation. And uh, of course, again, as I said earlier, the amount of stimulus that would be needed right, depends on the economic damage of, of the pandemic. So if the pandemic is uh, not controlled as of today, then we expect the damage to be um, bigger. And if the damage is bigger, then we should be spending more, right? And therefore the budget deficit is expected to be higher compared to the rest of the countries. But if you look at the second to the last column, which compares the budget deficit across ASEAN countries, um, we're seeing that Malaysia is close to 18%, right? So that's, uh, they have the highest actually, um, followed by Singapore, which is about 15.4%. Um, if you look at Lao PDR, they're at 8.8%, but they have zero deaths. Right, so considering that we have the highest deaths per uh, population, then we should expect that our economic stimulus should be bigger than that, at least Lao PDR, right? Um, so a budget deficit of, of, uh, of higher than 8.1%, um, say nine or 9.5%, is probably the, the appropriate scale. But again, as I mentioned earlier, if we're able to use off budget financing and if we're able to use economic stimulus productively, our budget deficit can in fact um, be managed at uh, say 7.5%. Next please. All right, so just to give you an idea again, um, how can we fund economic stimulus? I think that the best answer is would be loans. Um, of course, um, Arise provides for the possibility of using savings because there are certain government expenditure items that will certainly not be used because for example, um, that would include foreign travel. Um, you don't expect gov government agencies to send uh, their workers on foreign trips. And so we have a lot of savings on foreign travel. So those savings can be used for purposes of funding our economic stimulus. But I think um, the best way really is to use loans. And uh, why? Well, because number one, our credit rating has been recently upgraded thanks to our economic managers. They've been managing our macroeconomic um, fundamentals quite well. Uh, in terms of financial health, we are number top 10 in the world. The, that's a ranking that's uh, done by The Economist. We, I think, are number six in terms of financial health. In other words, we are in a very good position to take out loans. Um, credit rating agencies have assessed us as uh, uh, being worthy of loans. So let's make good use of that recently upgraded credit rating and uh, precisely take out loans for purposes of growing out of this uh, recession. 
Next, please. Again, so just to give you um, a sense of where we are in terms of uh, debt to GDP. Uh, again, thanks to our economic managers, um, in 2019, we've had a very low debt to GDP ratio at 39.6. I think that's um, a uh, record low, I think, since the, I, I don't know, two, three decades. And uh, we are now at 49.8% after all of those loans that we've taken out, which I've shown in the previous slide. And uh, just to give you a sense of whether 49.8 is big or small, in Malaysia, they're allowed to go up to 55%. So there's still some space for us to take out loans. Right, and uh, next please. I think this is my last slide. Again, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a wake up call for government to act on economic resilience, which is the ability of our economy to recover from shocks. And so our realization is that we're not as resilient as we ought to be, small things like, uh, like broadband connectivity is a problem, which clearly we need today. Um, so this long run, long, long run plan for economic resilience, which the bill provides for, must include structural reforms that we've been postponing in the last decades, which would include building the capacity of the health sector, again, um, more infrastructure projects, and uh, also things like um, improving the database of our government, particularly, to ensure that government is capable of providing social protection when necessary. So that's where my presentation ends. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions.